So the the thing that really interested me um, when I saw first saw your book was, yeah, it's it's about uh, trying to teach cryptocurrency, or at least a part of it is about trying to teach cryptocurrency to the North Koreans and this guy Virgil Griffith, who has just been uh, sentenced. So uh, why don't we like go back to the start of that? Like, how did you end up in in North Korea? Like, how, how do you what like series of events led you to that? Well, yeah, uh, before I go into that, I should say I wasn't there to teach uh, crypto to the North Koreans. It's just <laughs> what Virgil was convicted of. But as for how I ended up there, it's quite a long story. So uh, basically two reasons. Uh, I think number one is that I was born in China and I've always talked to my parents about how weird North Korea is and all the strange stuff that comes out of there. And my father would say it's not weird at all because that is quite similar to the China in which I grew up. Uh, he's saying that. And China has changed so much throughout the years, but North Korea, it has remained rather stagnant. So I've, I've always thought that if I could go to North Korea, I can see the land my parents grew up in kind of like a time capsule. And that has always been on my bucket list as a result. I, I tried to go several times. Uh, 2014, they were holding a marathon and they had the Ebola outbreak. So they, but I actually trained for that. So, and second reason is the crypto reason. And when North Korea announced that crypto conference, so it was open to the public, anyone could go. And I've read a lot about all the shady stuff that North Korea has been accused of doing with respect to crypto. Uh, because it's been subject to lots of sanctions and theoretically crypto is a way to get out of those sanctions. So I thought that if I were to go to North Korea, I can get a, an upfront look, uh, like a front row seat into what it's been doing. So those, those are my two motivations. Okay, so um, then the, the next thing I, I basically want to want to try and understand then is so this was just like a, a cryptocurrency conference, like a like they had the Bitcoin conference in Miami, except this one was in, in North Korea? That was how it was sold to us, but it actually turned out to be completely different. It was basically a glorified tourism trip. On the first day, we were told that the itinerary for the conference itself, which was only two days out of seven, it wasn't determined yet and therefore and not therefore but also that we weren't there to take in information from the north koreans we were there to present to them and that was very unexpected and i think for some of the people like one or two among the eight foreigners they were expecting to be speakers but for the rest of us we were really taken by surprise <laughs> yeah i mean i, I guess you, if you're arriving like just thinking you're gonna stand around and, and chat to people about about cryptocurrency even in north korea you're, you're not really expecting to them be presenting to them about it uh first off before we i, I get into like the one of the next things i want to ask is um what, what were the accusations being made of north korea and what, what have they been accused of using cryptocurrency to do basically mm -hmm. So uh, they have been accused of stealing lots of coins. And, you know, North Korea, it's a country that gets a lot of its money from criminal enterprises. So the, the, the fact that it's accused of hacking uh, all this crypto stuff, it's not that surprising because it's been uh, accused of smuggling drugs through their embassies and <laughs> so on and so forth. And on a higher level than simply stealing coins, there is also the fear that North Korea can transact internationally with crypto and get around all the sanctions crippling its economy. Okay. So basically they're trying to use this non-centralized um, and theoretically anonymous currency uh, in order to yeah, circumvent the, the international sanctions being put on the, yeah, on the, the regime. So when when you arrived in in North Korea, what was your first impression of the place? Like, what and what 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 sort of thing were you walking into at the at the at the crypto conference? Like, was it in I don't know, like a big building or a hall or just a room? It was kind of like that. It was like a big conference room, 
and with uh, imagine like a bigger version of that and the North Koreans will be gathered there and at the start of the conference they'll they'll march us in we'll all sit around a table and it's quite formal and they called us a delegation which I've always found so strange mm, yeah yeah it's a delegation I mean maybe that's just their way of presenting it and propaganda wise uh, so then when you arrive and you're, you've, you you've were talking to uh, some people there and then you ended up, I think you said, having to give a talk, um, essentially. What were the talks about and, and what were the North Koreans interested in learning about? So one thing I, I, I should say is that I don't think we ever got to interact with the North Korea's crypto folks. So... The, our North Korean minders, they were, they were on the tourism side, tourism and cultural side. And the previous um, engagements involved chaperoning foreign journalists. So I, and they told us North Korea doesn't know anything about crypto, which is definitely a lie. <laughs> and so the conference itself, I, I won't go too deeply into what each person, person specifically said. I actually declined to present because... And Virgil is still due to be sentenced, so I don't want to affect that in any way. But generally, because I think in large part, because so many of the presenters did not expect to be presenters, there was very little of substance presented. And the presentation materials were given to them, and they were publicly available research papers. And what was discussed at the conference, it's really just publicly available information. Mm. So I've heard this. I've heard this um, talked about. So I watched your interview on, I think it was Coinbase, uh, where you were talking about this, and and you kind of alluded to this idea that maybe he committed a crime in giving them the information as as like a an educator providing a service, rather than um, him being sentenced for. Uh, just speaking, because I, I get uh, you were you were talking about that that was the one of the defenses that they were going to use was that to say he's just presenting information freely that is available on the internet. Um, so do you think he? I, I know he's pled guilty now, but do you do you think he committed a, like a a really egregious crime? Uh, well, I think if you go by the letter of the law, I think he definitely broke it, um, but. Did he do something that is morally wrong? Uh, I, I think that's the question. And I don't think so. I don't think he had the intention of really helping North Korea in a geopolitical way. And he certainly didn't benefit personally. Like like all of us, he paid a lot of money to be there. Mm, yeah, it's not, it's not cheap to get to North Korea. Um, so... Did you, so you don't think you, you got to, to interact with any of the, the North Koreans or any of the crypto people? Like who, were you basically just talking to like a handful of people in the government? Like, did you meet any of the that more high ranking officials or was it just um, like a handful of people? Well, I would say our North Korean minders, uh, they seem to be high ranking people because we had a lot of interaction with them and they spoke really good English and they, they've been abroad. And, you know, they, they've watched the Avengers. So uh, they, they, they definitely were not. And we even talked about families and stuff like they, like this guy's fam, both his parents were doctors, you know, they definitely were not ordinary North Koreans. Um, but with respect to any real high level interaction, there, there really was none. We, we did have a meeting with one of their state, um, state companies and i really have no idea why that was arranged uh, but that that was a one-off thing we met them for for like an hour or two and that was it okay so uh, i was listening to this uh this interview over the last few days with um on lex friedman's podcast with uh alex gladstein uh the one i was talking about before we started here so he has been he was talking a lot about this idea of cryptocurrency being able to defeat authoritarians and, and tyrannical governments. Now, to a lot of people, that probably sounds like the most pipe dreamy Bitcoin maximalist rubbish. Um, <laughs> do you see any merit in the argument? Uh, because, I mean, he, he was making the case basically that if you give people the ability to spend money 
that isn't controlled by an authoritarian state, then that will help to break the break the grip that 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 government has on on the country. So, do you think there's there's any merit in this, or is this just like yeah, Bitcoin maxis, um, just yeah, living their pipe dream? So I I should first say I I, I love what Alex Gladstein writes. I've uh, he's some guy he's a guy I follow, but I think when he says you know, Bitcoin is something that can defeat uh, tyrannical governments. It's the same thing as saying democracy is like a very good thing for us. And it's like it's like an ideal. But I think when you put it into practice, uh, it's, it's not always perfect, but it doesn't mean it's not a goal we should strive toward. And I would actually tell a Gladstein story. He, um, he talked once about an Afghan woman who, uh, and stop me if you've heard of this before. Uh, no, he, I haven't. He's talking about when, when Afghan fell to the Taliban and our asset was falling and when the refugees were trying to escape, they, they don't get to take their money with them because of how bad the infrastructure is and how bad their currency is. It's not often talked about, but when they leave, they're often penniless. And, but there was this young woman because there was a period of westernization in Afghanistan when the coalition backed government was still in power and she was able, she had Bitcoin, she knew what it was and she traveled through Iran and Turkey and it was quite a harrowing journey. Her ship sank in the Mediterranean, but ultimately because she memorized her passphrase, she had nothing but the clothes in her back, but she was able to carry two Bitcoins in her head and she was able to fund a new life in Germany. Wow, that's such a great story. So yeah, so uh, yeah, because I guess that's that's something that people don't often think about is like you, we're just like, oh, I got my my debit card. That's all I need, right? Um, but uh, often when yeah, like when you said when you're when you're leaving countries like this, um, it can be very difficult, especially in the midst of absolute madness, to maybe like withdraw your money from the bank um, and then take it with you. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment for us in the comments below. Let me know what you thought and if you'd like to see more of this from the show. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time.